Tales of Power by Carlos Castaneda Chapter 13 The Bubble of Perception I spent the day by myself at Don Genaro's house. I slept most of the time. Don Juan came back in the late afternoon, and we hiked in complete silence to a nearby range of mountains. We stopped at dusk and sat on the edge of a deep gorge until it was almost dark. Then Don Juan led me to another place close by, a monumental cliff with a sheer vertical rock wall. The cliff was unnoticeable from the trail that led to it. Don Juan, however, had shown it to me several times before. He had made me look over the edge, and had told me that the whole cliff was a place of power, especially the base of it, which was a canyon several hundred feet down. Every time I had looked into it, I had had a discomforting chill. The canyon was always dark and menacing. Before we reached the place, Don Juan said that I had to go on by myself and meet Pablito on the edge of the cliff. He recommended that I should relax and perform the gate of power in order to wash away my nervous tiredness. Don Juan stepped aside to the left of the trail, and the darkness simply swallowed him. I wanted to stop and examine where he had gone, but my body did not obey. I began to jog, although I was so tired that I could hardly keep on my feet. When I reached the cliff, I could not see anyone there, and I went on jogging in place, breathing deeply. After a while, I relaxed a bit. I stood motionless with my back against a rock, and I noticed then the shape of a man a few feet away from me. He was sitting, hiding his head in his arms. I had a moment of intense fright and recoiled, but then I explained to myself that the man must be Pablito, and without any hesitation I advanced towards him. I called Pablito's name out loud. I figured that he must have been uncertain of who I was and had become so scared that he had covered his head not to look. But before I reached him, some inexplicable fear took possession of me. My body froze on the spot, with my right arm already extended to touch him. The man lifted his head up. It was not Pablito. His eyes were two enormous mirrors, like a tiger's eyes. My body jumped backwards, my muscles tensed, and then released the tension without the slightest influence of my volition, and I performed a backward leap, so fast and so far that under normal conditions I would have plunged into a grandiose speculation about it. As it was, however, my fright was so out of proportion that I had no inclination for pondering, and I would have run out of there had it not been that someone held my arm forcibly. The feeling that someone was holding me by the arm threw me into total panic. I screamed. My outburst, instead of being the shriek I thought it should have been, was a long, chilling yell. I turned to face my assailant. It was Pablito, who was shaking even more than me. My nervousness was at its peak. I could not talk. My teeth chattered, and ripples went through my back, making me jerk involuntarily. I had to breathe through my mouth. Pablito said between chatters that the Nagual had been waiting for him that he had barely gotten out of its clutches when he bumped into me, and that I had nearly killed him with my yell. I wanted to laugh, and made the most weird sounds imaginable. <laughs> when I regained my calmness, I told Pablito that apparently the same thing had happened to me. The end result in my case had been that my fatigue had vanished. I felt instead an uncontainable surge of strength and well-being. Pablito seemed to be experiencing the same sensations, we began to giggle in a nervous, silly way. I heard the sound of soft and careful steps in the distance. I detected the sound before Pablito. He appeared to react to my stiffening. I had the certainty that someone was approaching the place where we were. We turned in the direction of the sound. A moment later, the silhouettes of Don Juan and Don Genaro became visible. They were walking calmly and stopped four or five feet away from us. Don Juan was facing me, and Don Genaro faced Pablito. I wanted to tell Don Juan that something had scared me nearly out of my wits, but Pablito squeezed my arm. I knew what he meant. There was something strange about Don Juan and Don Genaro. As I looked at them, my eyes began to get out of focus. Don Genaro gave a sharp command. I did not understand what he had said, but I knew he had meant that we should not cross our eyes. The darkness has settled on the world, 
Don Juan said, looking at the sky. Don Genaro drew a half moon on the hard ground. For a moment, it seemed to me that he had used some iridescent chalk, but then I realized that he was not holding anything in his hands. I was perceiving the imaginary half moon that he had drawn with his finger. He made Pablito and me sit on the inner curve of the convex edge, while he and Don Juan sat cross-legged on the extreme ends of the half moon, six or seven feet away from us. Don Juan spoke first. He said that they were going to show us their allies. He told us that if we would gaze at their left sides, between their hips and their rib bones, we would see something like a rag or a handkerchief hanging from their belts. Don Hanaro added that next to the rags on their belts, there were two round button-like things, and that we should gaze at their belts until we saw the rags and the buttons. Before Don Hanaro had spoken, I had already noticed some flat item like a piece of cloth and one round pebble that hung from their belts. Don Juan's allies were darker and more menacing than Don Hanaro's. My reaction was a mixture of curiosity and fear. My reactions were experienced in my stomach, and I was not judging anything in a rational manner. Don Juan and Don Genaro reached for their belts and seemed to unhook the dark pieces of cloth. They took them with their left hands. Don Juan flung his in the air above his head, but Don Genaro let his drop to the ground gently. The pieces of cloth stretched as if the hurling and the dropping had made them spread like perfectly smooth handkerchiefs. They descended slowly, bobbing like kites. The movement of Don Juan's ally was the exact replica of what I had perceived him doing when he had whirled around days before. As the pieces of cloth got closer to the ground, they became solid, round, and massive. They first curled as though they had fallen over a doorknob. Then they expanded. Don Juan's grew into a voluminous shadow. It took the lead and moved towards us, crushing small rocks and hard lumps of dirt. It came within four or five feet of us to the very dip of the half moon between Don Juan and Don Genaro. At one moment, I thought it was going to roll over us and pulverize us. My terror at that instant was like a burning fire. The shadow in front of me was gigantic, perhaps 14 feet high and six feet across. It moved as if it were feeling its way around with no eyes. It jerked and wobbled. I knew that it was looking for me. Pablito at that moment hit his head against my chest. The sensation that his movement produced in me dispelled some of the awesome attention that I had focused on the shadow. The shadow seemed to become disassociated, judging by its erratic jerks, and then it moved out of sight, merging with the darkness around. I shook Pablito. He lifted his head and let out a muffled scream. I looked up. A strange man was staring at me. He seemed to have been right behind the shadow, perhaps hiding behind it. He was rather tall and lanky. He had a long face, no hair, and the left side of his head was covered by a rash or an eczema of some sort. His eyes were wild and shiny. His mouth was half open. He wore some strange pajama-like clothing. His pants were too short for him. I could not distinguish whether or not he had shoes on. He stood looking at us for what seemed to be a long time, as if waiting for an opening in order to lurch at us and tear us apart. There was so much intensity in his eyes. It was not hatred or violence, but some sort of animal feeling of distrust. I could not stand the tension any longer. I wanted to adopt a fighting position that Don Juan had taught me years before, and I would have done so had it not been for Pablito, who whispered that the ally could not go over the line that Don Genaro had drawn on the ground. I realized then that there was indeed a bright line that seemed to detain whatever was in front of us. After a moment, the man moved away to the left, just like the shadow before. I had the sensation that Don Juan and Don Genaro had called them both back. There was a short, quiet pause. I could not see Don Juan or Don Genaro anymore. They were no longer sitting on the points of the half moon. Suddenly, I heard the sound of two small pebbles hitting the solid rock floor where we were sitting, and in a flash, the area in front of us 
lit up as if a mellow yellowish light had been turned on. In front of us, there was a ravenous beast, a giant nauseating-looking coyote or wolf. Its whole body was covered with a white secretion like perspiration or saliva. Its hair was raggedy and wet. Its eyes were wild. It growled with a blind fury that sent chills through me. Its jaw shivered, and globs of saliva flew all over the place. It pawed the ground like a mad dog trying to get loose from a chain. Then it stood on its hind legs and moved its front paws and its jaws rapidly. All its fury seemed to be concentrated on breaking some barrier in front of us. I became aware that my fear of that crazed animal was of a different sort than the fear of the two apparitions I had witnessed before. My dread of that beast was a physical revulsion and horror. I looked on in utter impotence at its rage. Suddenly it seemed to lose its wildness and trotted out of sight. I heard then something else coming towards us, or perhaps I sensed it. All of a sudden, the shape of a colossal feline loomed in front of us. I first saw its eyes in the darkness. They were huge and fixed like two pools of water reflecting light. It snorted and growled softly. It exhaled air and moved back and forth in front of us without taking its eyes away from us. It did not have the electric glow that the coyote had. I could not distinguish its features clearly, and yet its presence was infinitely more ominous than the other beasts. It seemed to be gathering strength. I felt that it was so daring that it would go beyond its limits. Pablito must have had a similar feeling, for he whispered that I should duck my head and lie almost flat against the ground. A second later, the feline charged. It ran towards us, and then it leaped with its paws extended forward. I closed my eyes and hid my head in my arms against the ground. I felt that the beast had ripped the protective line that Don Genaro had drawn around us and was actually on top of us. I felt its weight pinning me down. The fur on its belly rubbed against my neck. It seemed that its forelegs were caught in something. It wriggled to set itself free. I felt its jerking and prodding and heard its diabolic puffing and hissing. I knew then that I was lost. I had a vague sense of a rational choice, and I wanted to resign myself calmly to my fate of dying there, but I was afraid of the physical pain of dying under such awful circumstances. Then some strange force surged from my body. It was as if my body refused to die and pooled all its strength in one single point, my left arm and hand. I felt an indomitable surge coming through it. Something uncontrollable was taking possession of my body, something that forced me to push the massive malignant weight of that beast off of us. Pablito seemed to have reacted in the same fashion, and we both stood up at once. There was so much energy created by both of us that the beast was flung like a rag doll. The exertion had been supreme. I collapsed on the ground, panting for air. The muscles of my stomach were so tense that I could not breathe. I did not pay any attention to what Pablito was doing. I finally noticed that Don Juan and Don Genaro were helping me to sit up. I saw Pablito spread on the ground face down with his arms outstretched. He seemed to have fainted. After they had made me sit up, Don Juan and Don Genaro helped Pablito. Both of them rubbed his stomach and back. They made him stand up, and after a while he could sit up by himself again. Don Juan and Don Genaro sat on the ends of the half moon, and then they began to move in front of us as if a rail existed between the two points, a rail that they were using to shift their positions back and forth from one side to the other. Their movements made me dizzy. They finally stopped next to Pablito and began to whisper in his ear. After a moment, they stood up, all three of them at once, and walked to the edge of the cliff. Don Genaro lifted Pablito as if he were a child. Pablito's body was stiff like a board. Don Juan held Pablito by the ankles. He whirled him around, seemingly to gain momentum and force, and finally he let go of his legs 
and hurled his body out over the abyss away from the edge of the cliff. I saw Pablito's body against the dark western sky. It described circles, just like Don Juan's body had done days before. The circles were slow. Pablito seemed to be gaining altitude instead of falling down. Then the circling became accelerated. Pablito's body twirled like a disc for a moment, and then it disintegrated. I perceived that it had vanished in thin air. Don Juan and Don Genaro came to my side, squatted by me, and proceeded to whisper in my ears. Each said something different, yet I had no trouble in following their commands. It was as if I became split the instant they uttered their first words. I felt that they were doing with me what they had done with Pablito. Don Genaro made me whirl, and then I had the thoroughly conscious sensation of spinning or floating for a moment. Next, I was rushing through the air, plummeting down to the ground at a tremendous speed. I felt as I was falling that my clothes were ripping off. Then my flesh fell off, and finally only my head remained. I had the very clear sensation that as my body became dismembered, I lost my superfluous weight, and thus my falling lost its momentum, and my speed decreased. My descent was no longer a vertigo. I began to move back and forth like a leaf. Then my head was stripped of its weight, and all that was left of me was a square centimeter, a nugget, a tiny pebble-like residue. All my feeling was concentrated there. Then the nugget seemed to burst, and I was a thousand pieces. I knew, or something somewhere knew, that I was aware of the thousand pieces at once. I was the awareness itself. Then some part of that awareness began to be stirred. It rose, grew. It became localized, and little by little, I regained the sense of boundaries, consciousness, or whatever, and suddenly the me I knew and was familiar with erupted into the most spectacular view of all the imaginable combinations of beautiful scenes. It was as if I were looking at thousands of pictures of the world, of people, of things. The scenes then became blurry. I had the sensation that they were being passed in front of my eyes at a greater speed until I could not single out any of them for examination. Finally, it was as if I were witnessing the organization of the world rolling past my eyes in an unbroken, endless chain. I suddenly found myself standing on the cliff with Don Juan and Don Genaro. They whispered that they had pulled me back and that I had witnessed the unknown that no one can talk about. They said that they were going to hurl me into it once more and that I should let the wings of my perception unfold and touch the tonal and the nagual at once without being aware of going back and forth from one to the other. I again had the sensations of being tossed, spinning, and falling down at a tremendous speed. Then I exploded. I disintegrated. Something in me gave out. It released something I had kept locked up all my life. I was thoroughly aware then that my secret reservoir had been tapped and that it poured out unrestrainedly. There was no longer the sweet unity I call me. There was nothing, and yet that nothing was filled. It was not light or darkness, hot or cold, pleasant or unpleasant. It was not that I moved or floated or was stationary. Neither was I a single unit, a self, as I am accustomed to being. I was a myriad of selves, which were all me, a colony of separate units that had a special allegiance to one another and would join unavoidably to form one single awareness, my human awareness. It was not that I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, because there was nothing I could have known with, but all my single awarenesses knew that the I, the me of my familiar world, was a colony, a conglomerate of separate and independent feelings that had an unbending solidarity to one another. The unbending solidarity of my countless awarenesses, 
the allegiance that those parts had for one another, was my life force. A way of describing that unified sensation would be to say that those nuggets of awareness were scattered. Each of them was aware of itself, and none was more predominant than the other. Then something would stir them, and they would join and emerge into an area where all of them had to be pooled in one clump, the me I know. As me, myself, then, I would witness a coherent scene of worldly activity, or a scene that pertained to other worlds and which I thought must have been pure imagination, or a scene that pertained to pure thinking, that is. I had views of intellectual systems, or of ideas strung together as verbalizations. In some scenes, I talked to myself to my heart's content. After every one of those coherent views, the me would disintegrate and be nothing once more. During one of those excursions into a coherent view, I found myself on the cliff with Don Juan. I instantly realized that I was then the total me I am familiar with. I felt my physicality as real. I was in the world rather than merely viewing it. Don Juan hugged me like a child. He looked at me. His face was very close. I could see his eyes in the darkness. They were kind. They seemed to hold a question. I knew what it was. The unspeakable was truly unspeakable. Well, he asked softly, as if he would need my reaffirmation. I was speechless. The words numb, bewildered, confused, and so on were not in any way appropriate descriptions of my feelings at that moment. I was not solid. I knew that Don Juan had to grab me and keep me forcibly on the ground, otherwise I would have floated in the air and disappeared. I was not afraid of vanishing. I longed for the unknown where my awareness was not unified. Don Juan walked me slowly, pushing down on both of my shoulders, to an area around Don Genaro's house. He made me lie down, and then covered me with soft dirt from a pile that he seemed to have prepared beforehand. He covered me up to my neck. With leaves, he made a sort of pillow for my head to rest on, and told me not to move or fall asleep at all. He said that he was going to sit and keep me company until the earth again consolidated my form. I felt very comfortable, and had a nearly invincible desire to fall asleep, but Don Juan would not let me. He demanded that I should talk about anything under the sun except what I had just experienced. I did not know what to talk about at first. Then I asked about Don Genaro. Don Juan said that Don Genaro had taken Pablito and had buried him somewhere around there and was doing with him what he himself was doing with me. I had the desire to sustain the conversation, but something in me was incomplete. I had an unusual indifference, a tiredness that was more like boredom. Don Juan seemed to know how I felt. He began to talk about Pablito and how our fates were interlocked. He said that he became Pablito's benefactor at the same time that Don Genaro became his teacher, and that power had paired Pablito and me step by step. He made the emphatic remark that the only difference between Pablito and me was that while Pablito's world as a warrior was governed by coercion and fear, mine was governed by affection and freedom. Don Juan explained that such a difference was due to the intrinsically different personalities of the benefactors. Don Genaro was sweet and affectionate and funny, while he himself was dry, authoritarian, and direct. He said that my personality demanded a strong teacher but a tender benefactor, and that Pablito was the opposite. He needed a kind teacher and a stern benefactor. We talked for a while longer, and then it was morning. When the sun appeared over the mountains on the eastern horizon, he helped me to get up from under the dirt. After I woke up in the early afternoon, Don Juan and I sat by the door of Don Genaro's house. Don Juan said that Don Genaro was still with Pablito, preparing him for the last encounter. Tomorrow you and Pablito will go into the unknown, he said. I must prepare you for it now. You will go into it by yourselves. Last night you two were like yo-yos being pulled back and forth. Tomorrow you will be on your own. I had then a rush of curiosity, and questions about my experiences of the night before just poured out of me. He was unruffled by my barrage.
Today I have to accomplish a most crucial maneuver, he said. I have to trick you for the last time, and you must fall for my tricking. He laughed and slapped his thighs. What Hanaro wanted to show you with the first exercise the other night was how sorcerers use the nagual, he went on. There is no way to get to the sorcerer's explanation unless one has willingly used the nagual, or rather, unless one has willingly used the tonal to make sense out of one's actions in the nagual. Another way of making all this clear is to say that the view of the tonal must prevail if one is going to use the nagual the way sorcerers do. I told him that I had found a blatant incongruity in what he had just said. On the one hand, he had given me two days before an incredible recapitulation of his studied acts over a period of years, acts designed to affect my view of the world, and on the other hand, he wanted that same view to prevail. One has nothing to do with the other, he said. Order in our perception is the exclusive realm of the tonal. Only there can our actions have a sequence. Only there are they like stairways where one can count the steps. There is nothing of that sort in the nagual. Therefore, the view of the tonal is a tool. And as such, it is not only the best tool, but the only one we've got. Last night, your bubble of perception opened, and its wings unfolded. There is nothing else to say about it. It is impossible to explain what happened to you, so I'm not going to attempt to, and you shouldn't try to either. It should be enough to say that the wings of your perception were made to touch your totality. Last night you went back and forth from the Nagual to the Tonal time and time again. You were hurled in twice so as to leave no possibility for mistakes. The second time you experienced the full impact of the journey into the unknown and your perception unfolded its wings when something in you realized your true nature. You are a cluster. This is the sorcerer's explanation. The nagual is the unspeakable. All the possible feelings and beings and selves float in it like barges, peaceful, unaltered, forever. Then the glue of life binds some of them together. You yourself found that out last night, and so did Pablito, and so did Hinaro the time he journeyed into the unknown, and so did I. When the glue of life binds those feelings together, a being is created, a being that loses the sense of its true nature and becomes blinded by the glare and clamor of the area where beings hover, the tonal. The tonal is where all the unified organization exists. A being pops into the tonal once the force of life has bound all the needed feelings together. I said to you once that the tonal begins at birth and ends at death. I said that because I know that as soon as the force of life leaves the body, all those single awarenesses disintegrate and go back again to where they came from, the nagual. What a warrior does in journeying into the unknown is very much like dying except that his cluster of single feelings do not disintegrate, but expand a bit, without losing their togetherness. At death, however, they sink deeply and move independently as if they had never been a unit. I wanted to tell him how completely homogenous were his statements with my experience, but he did not let me talk. There is no way to refer to the unknown, he said. One can only witness it. The sorcerer's explanation says that each of us has a center from which the nagual can be witnessed, the will. Thus a warrior can venture into the nagual and let his cluster arrange and rearrange itself in any way possible. I've said to you that the expression of the nagual is a personal matter. I meant that it is up to the individual warrior himself to direct the arrangement and rearrangements of that cluster. The human form or human feeling is the original one. Perhaps it is the sweetest form of them all to us. There are, however, an endless number of alternative forms which the cluster may adopt. I have said to you that a sorcerer can adopt any form he wants. That is true. A sorcerer who is in possession of the totality of himself can direct the parts of his cluster to join in any conceivable way. 
The force of life is what makes all that shuffling possible. Once the force of life is exhausted, there is no way to reassemble that cluster. I have called that cluster the bubble of perception. I have also said that it is sealed, closed tightly, and that it never opens until the moment of our death. Yet it could be made to open. Sorcerers have obviously learned that secret, and although not all of them arrive at the totality of themselves, they know about the possibility of it. They know that the bubble opens only when one plunges into the Nagual. Yesterday, I gave you a recapitulation of all the steps that you have followed to arrive at that point. He scrutinized me as if he were waiting for a comment or a question. What he had said was beyond comment. I understood then that it would have been of no consequence if he had told me everything 14 years before, or if he would have told it to me at any point during my apprenticeship. What was important was the fact that I had experienced with or in my body the premises of his explanation. I'm waiting for your usual question, he said, voicing his words slowly. What question? I asked. The one your reason is itching to voice. Today I relinquish all questions. I really don't have any, Don Juan. That's not fair, he said, laughing. There is one particular question that I need you to ask. He said that if I would shut off my internal dialogue for just an instant, I could discern what the question was. I had a sudden thought, a momentary insight, and I knew what he wanted. Where was my body while all that was happening to me, Don Juan? I asked, and he broke into a belly laugh. This is the last of the sorcerer's tricks, he said. Let's say that what I'm going to reveal to you is the last bit of the sorcerer's explanation. Up to this point, your reason has haphazardly followed my doings. Your reason is willing to admit that the world is not as the description portrays it, that there is much more to it than what meets the eye. Your reason is almost willing and ready to admit that your perception went up and down that cliff, or that something in you, or even all of you, leaped to the bottom of the gorge and examined with the eyes of the tonal what was there, as if you had descended bodily with a rope and ladder. That act of examining the bottom of the gorge was the crown of all these years of training. You did it well. Hinaro saw the cubic centimeter of chance when he threw a rock at the yew that was at the bottom of the ravine. You saw everything. Hinaro and I knew then, without a doubt, that you were ready to be hurled into the unknown. At that instant, you not only saw, but you knew all about the double, the other. I interrupted and told him that he was giving me undeserving credit for something that was beyond my understanding. His reply was that I needed time to let all those impressions settle down, and that once I had done that, answers would just pour out of me in the same manner that questions had poured out of me in the past. The secret of the double is in the bubble of perception, which in your case that night was at the top of the cliff and at the bottom of the gorge at the same time, he said. The cluster of feelings can be made to assemble instantly anywhere. In other words, one can perceive the here and the there at once. He urged me to think and remember a sequence of actions which he said were so ordinary that I had almost forgotten them. I did not know what he was talking about. He coaxed me to try harder. Think about your hat, he said, and think what Hanaro did with it. I had a shocking moment of realization. I had forgotten that Don Hanaro had actually wanted me to take off my hat because it kept on falling off, blown by the wind. But I did not want to let go of it. I had felt stupid being naked. Wearing a hat, which I ordinarily never do, gave me a sense of strangeness. I was not really myself, in which case being without clothes was not so embarrassing. Don Hanaro had then attempted to change hats with me, but his was way too small for my head. He made jokes about the size of my head and the proportions of my body, and finally he took my hat off and wrapped my head with an old poncho, like a turban. I told Don Juan that I had forgotten about that sequence, which I was sure had happened in between my so-called leaps. And yet the memory of those leaps stood as a unit which was uninterrupted. They certainly were an uninterrupted unit, and so was Hanaro's cavorting with your hat, he said. 
those two memories cannot be made to go one after the other, because they happened at the same time. He made the fingers of his left hand move as if they could not fit into the spaces between the fingers of his right hand. Those leaps were only the beginning, he went on. Then came your true excursion into the unknown. Last night you experienced the unspeakable, the Nagual. Your reason cannot fight the physical knowledge that you are a nameless cluster of feelings. Your reason at this point might even admit that there is another center of assemblage, the will, through which it is possible to judge or assess and use the extraordinary effects of the Nagual. It has finally dawned on your reason that one can reflect the Nagual through the will, although one can never explain it. But then comes your question. Where was I when all that was taking place? Where was my body? The conviction that there is a real you is a result of the fact that you have rallied everything you've got around your reason. At this point, your reason admits that the Nagual is the indescribable, not because the evidence has convinced it, but because it is safe to admit it. Your reason is on safe ground. All the elements of the Tonal are on its side. Don Juan paused and examined me. His smile was kind. Let's go to Genaro's place of predilection, he said abruptly. He stood up, and we walked to the rock where we had talked two days before. We sat comfortably on the same spots with our backs against the rock. To make reason feel safe is always the task of the teacher, he said. I've tricked your reason into believing that the tonal was accountable and predictable. Hanaro and I have labored to give you the impression that only the Nagual was beyond the scope of explanation. The proof that the tricking was successful is that at this moment it seems to you that in spite of everything you have gone through, there is still a core that you can claim as your own, your reason. That's a mirage. Your precious reason is only a center of assemblage, a mirror that reflects something which is outside of it. Last night, you witnessed not only the indescribable Nagual, but also the indescribable Tonal. The last piece of the sorcerer's explanation says that reason is merely reflecting an outside order, and that reason knows nothing about that order. It cannot explain it. In the same way, it cannot explain the Nagual. Reason can only witness the effects of the Tonal, but never ever could it understand it or unravel it. The very fact that we are thinking and talking points out an order that we follow without ever knowing how we do that or what the order is. I brought up then the idea of Western man's research into the workings of the brain as a possibility of explaining what that order was. He pointed out that all that that research did was to attest that something was happening. Sorcerers do the same thing with their will, he said. They say that through the will they can witness the effects of the Nagual. I can add now that through reason, no matter what we do with it or how we do it, we are merely witnessing the effects of the Tonal. In both cases, there is no hope ever to understand or to explain what it is that we are witnessing. Last night was the first time that you flew on the wings of your perception. You were still very timid. You ventured only on the band of human perception. A sorcerer can use those wings to touch other sensibilities. A crow's, for instance, a coyote's, a cricket's, or the order of other worlds in that infinite space. Do you mean other planets, Don Juan? Certainly. The wings of perception can take us to the most recondite confines of the Nagual, or to inconceivable worlds of the Tonal. Can a sorcerer go to the moon, for instance? Of course he can, he replied. But he wouldn't be able to bring back a bag of rocks, though. We laughed and joked about it, but his statement had been made in ultimate seriousness. We have arrived at the last part of the sorcerer's explanation, he said. Last night, Hanaro and I showed you the last two points that make the totality of man, the Nagual and the Tonal. I once told you that those two points were outside of oneself, and yet they were not. That is the paradox of the luminous beings. The Tonal of every one of us is but a reflection of that indescribable unknown filled with order. The Nagual of every one of us is but a reflection of that indescribable void 
that contains everything. Now you should sit on Hinaro's place of predilection until twilight. By then, you should have pounded the sorcerer's explanation into place. As you sit here now, you have nothing except the force of your life that binds that cluster of feelings. He stood up. Tomorrow's task is to plunge into the unknown by yourself while Hanaro and I watch you without intervening, he said. Sit here and turn off your internal dialogue. You may gather the power needed to unfold the wings of your perception and fly to that infinitude.